Hello there. In this video, I want to talk about this paper, Similarity of Neural Network Representations Revisited. This paper is published by Google Brain, and you see the Jeffrey Hinton name. Uh, I think he was supervisor in this project. And basically, they are talking about how we can measure similarity between two networks. So if you have a neural network here, and we have another neural network here, so two different neural networks, and also, if you suppose that, for example, this is uh, data set one, and this is data set two, and this is data set three. So the thing is, uh, suppose these neural network architectures are different, and also these data sets are different, uh, but maybe in the same domain. Uh, they can be in different domain too, but we may have different purposes for doing that. But for simplicity, suppose that we have, uh, this is as uh, network number one, and this is as network number two, and this is data set one, and data set two, and data set three. So uh, the, the question is, if I train these two different network, it's same data set, how I can measure that these two different network, different architecture, are learning similar things in, in different layer? Maybe this network has 10 different layers, this network has five different layers, you want to just check that if they are learning same representation or they are learning completely different representation. This is one of the things that this paper solves. Another thing is that if we have trained one architecture with different data set, but as I said, maybe these two data sets are from same domain, but maybe we have different versioning of them, we have collected them differently. We want to check that if this neural network one is learning, again, same representation when we feeding data set one and data set two or not. So that's another thing that this paper can solve. Moreover, if we have trained data set one with architecture one and data set two with this architecture, maybe we want to see that are these two network having same representation in one of these layers respecting to each other? Maybe, as I said, the domain of these data sets are same, and we want to catch that we always need some representation for training a neural network, and maybe we can design a better architecture or better layer that capture those representation and customize those. So all of these things can be solved by reading this paper. They are introducing a matrix called center kernel alignment, very similar to canonical coloration analysis. I will explain these in a few minutes. And that center kernel alignment can be used for this purpose, for measuring the similarity of two different uh, matrix and two different weights, better say. The problem of understanding and characterizing the neural network representation learned from data remains actively underexplored. They said a window into the network representation can provide more information about interaction between machine learning algorithms and data than the value of the loss function. They said this paper can solve some of the problem. First is, do deep neural network with same architecture trained from different random initialization learn similar representation? Second, can we establish correspondence between layers of different network architectures? And third, how similar are representation learned using the same neural network architecture from different data sets. So let's jump to the paper. Um, in the first page, you're talking about what features should we have in the similarity metrics. So suppose we have a neural network and let's concentrate on just one layer, maybe a convolution layer. Suppose this is just one layer of convolution. I have a permutation in the weights and because of that permutation, the features go to the next layer. It's still the same, but they are just permutated. So if you want to compare this layer with another layer that features and weights maybe are same, but as I said, they are just permutated, we want to have a high similarity score. So this is one of the things that we want. But they are talking about three different strategies here. First, that the metrics doesn't need to be invariance to invertible linear transformation. So I highlight that. 
it doesn't need to be invariance to invertible linear transformation, but it should be invariance to orthogonal transformation, and it should be invariant to the isotropic scaling. So let's start with the easiest one, which is isotropic scaling. So in isotropic scaling, it said, if we have a transformation, if we want to have a similarity matrix between two different variables, we want to say that these um, scaling alpha and beta shouldn't affect on the similarity index. So if you have two different networks, suppose this X and Y are one layer of convolutional in two different networks, or maybe they are two different layers in one network. If you apply that similarity matrix on these two layers, and we have a scaling on them, the similarity matrix shouldn't change. That is feasible. Second one, is the invariance to or orthogonal transformation. So the orthonormal matrices has this condition that the multiplication with their transpose leads to the identity matrix. So they are ortho orthonormal in the space. So they mentioned here, invariance to orthogonal transformations seem desirable for neural network. Invariance to orthogonal transformation implies invariance to permutation, which is needed to accom accommodate symmetric of neural network. This is exactly what we have talked so far. One of the other important things I want to mention is that usually the gradient descent direction is in the direction of the largest eigenvector. And applying autonormal transformation doesn't change the uh, largest eigenvector. So that's why it's also mentioned it is desirable for neural networks trained by gradient descent. And also it's mentioned here that in linear case, orthogonal transformation of the input does not affect dynamic of gradient descent training. So they have some other term that they discuss about the QR decomposition. I don't want to go through that. So, so far, we know that scaling and orthogonal transformation shouldn't affect of the, on the similarity metric. So what is invariance to invertible linear transformation? So it said a similarity index is invariant to invertible linear transformation if we have a transformation on two vectors, but still the similarity matrix doesn't change. And there is another assumption that A is full rank and B also is full rank matrix. Why they are saying that this is one of the things that we can have in similarity is because in neural network, if you have some sort of these things like weights in, inside inputs, so we can assume that maybe uh, one of the input can have also the inverse of this coefficient for transformation. That's why it's called invertible linear transformation. And these two can preserve the output of fx. So it mentioned, it seems that this transformation does not change the network. And one may prefer that have a similarity index that is invariant to invertible linear transformation. A limitation of uh, invariance to invertible linear transformation is that any invariant similarity index gives the same result for any representation of width greater than or equal to the data set size. It's also mentioned here, there is a practical problem with invariance to invertible linear transformation. Some neural network, especially convolutional neural network, have more neurons in some layers than there are example in the training data set. It is somewhat unnatural that a similarity index could require more example than we than were used for training. This is not the only problem that invariance to invertible linear transformation does. There is another problem that's, that's, uh, that I mentioned in the orthogonal transformation about uh, the largest eigenvector. Gradient descent converge first along the eigenvector corresponding to the largest, largest eigenvalue of the input covariance matrix. When apply this transformation, we may change the eigenvector, and therefore, we may change the eigenvalue corresponding to the eigenvector. This implies that the scale of direction in activation space is irrelevant. However, a scale information is both consistent across network and uses across tasks. A similarity index that is invariant to in, uh, invertible linear transformation ignore this aspect of representation and assign the same score to network that match only in large principal component or network that match only in a small principal component. So to put simply, you can say, we want a similarity matrix that is not invariant to invertible linear transformation, but it should 
have invariance to orthogonal transformation and isotropic scaling. So that's why they are showing here some of the similarity structure that people can use for comparing two different matrices. So the first one is just calculating the norm and that norm can be the Frobenius norm. And if we center that X and Y, we can convert this Frobenius norm to a uh, covariance of these two variables and then get the norm of that covariance matrix. So it's called Hilbert-Schmidt independence criterion. And HSIC is also famous in uh, doing the hypothesis testing. The next one is a centered kernel alignment, which is in this paper is talked about as one of the good approach for applying the similarity matrix. That HSIC is invariance to orthogonal transformation, but is not invariance to isotropic scaling. That's why this is just the terms for scaling this HSIC. Then they have a table here. They're showing what type of similarity index we can use. For example, linear regression, a canonical correlation analysis, or maybe a CKA with RBF kernel or CKA with linear kernel. So you can see that we can have a kernel here because HSIC can get any kernel. And also they are showing here that if we choose one of them, we may have one of these uh, features of invariance or we may not have. So you can see the CKA is isotropic, is invariant to isotropic scaling and orthogonal transformation, but it's not invertible linear transformation invariance. That's why these are good approaches for doing the similarity between uh, two metrics. In this paper, they talked about all of these, about how we can, for example, calculate the canonical correlation analysis and their formulation. But I don't want to go through these details. I just want to show you that if we use linear CKA and RBF CKA, how we can compare layers of neural network. So for understanding that which of these uh, metrics are useful for, um, for comparing the layers, they did a sanity check. For this sanity check, they had two identical ar architectures and they initialized them with two different random variables and then train a uh, a specific data set. So they assume that this layer of this network should correspond to this layer of network because everything is same, architecture is same, and they are training on the same data set. So they should see uh, if the performance of two networks are same, they should see very similar a score between corresponding layers. So they calculate that, and here they are showing that if they apply CKA and also uh, with the RBF with different size, so they're showing that all other metrics are not good and they are not showing uh, the similarity that we expected. But the CKA for linear and for using the RBF kernel, they are showing very good similarity. That, that is exactly what we expected. They are also showing these figures. They're showing that if we compare layer two with layer two of the second network, how much similarity we will get. So we expect we get uh, something like identity matrix here, but maybe two consecutive layers are also has some similarity, which is showing here. After this sanity check, they are doing some exciting experiments. First of all, they call this as a experiment to find the pathology of the architecture. So they are showing here that if you have a network train on a data set, if you increase the layer size, what will happen exactly? Are we just repeating some redundant information? And they are just showing here on a CNN with different depth, like in two, four, and eight times. You can see two, four, and eight times. Doubling depth improved accuracy, but greater multipliers hurt accuracy. And at eight X depth, CKA indicates that representation of more than half of the network are very similar to the last layer. You can see here that the representation of this layer are very similar. All of these layers are very similar to the last layer. So it may be it's showing that we can uh, reduce the size of the layers and just use, for example, in this case, like 32, I guess. You can see these figures are very important because uh, from the time that similarity increased to a high degree, 
we can truncate the network. Another experiment they've done is that if we see even layers and odd layers, what happened? Because odd layers usually show the activation layers, and even layers are like the convolutions and the operations. Another thing they, they just discussed here is that the CKA can reveal relationship between layers of different architectures. For example, we have ResNet 32 and ResNet 40, and we can compare that uh, some of these layers are uh, showing same representation, or very similar representation to each other. The increasing layer width leads to more similar representation between networks. As width increases, CKA approaches to one. CKA of earlier layers saturate faster than last layers. These are some important points uh, that we can see from the experiments they've done. Networks are generally more similar to other networks of the same width than they are to the widest network we trained. Another thing, as we mentioned, they show is training same networks with different data sets. And they showed models trained on different data sets develop similar representation, and these representations differ from untrained models. So that's another sanity check that they've done. So that's maybe, maybe is one of the reasons that if you have uh, two different data sets from domain, and if you use one of these trained model on one of the data set as a pre-trained model for training another model on the second data set, that usually perform well and converge faster. So the next thing I want to show you is that if you search for centered kernel alignment and you search for Git, you will find um, some codes here. They're also mentioning that this is a reproducing that paper similarity of neural network revisited. That's why I'm not implementing that from scratch. That is uh, very simple and easy if you check that uh, IPYNB file on Jupyter Notebook file. And you'll see here that they have implemented some function like linear CKA or kernel CKA, and they can compare two different uh, average activation activation here. So for example, they have a uh, metrics as the activation uh, in 1000 in 64 and another one in 1064. And they can just call these function for calculating the similarities and print them. And you'll see that they are showing high similarity using the uh, CKA and uh, the CCA, the canonical correlation analysis is not performing good as CKA. There is also some other example if you have different kind of models and if you want to have uh, different arch architectures. So the good things about CKA is that it can be applied on uh, multi-dimension matrix. It's just not comparing two vectors respecting to each other and it's assuming the invariance to isotropic and also invariance to uh, orthogonal transformation. That's it. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please leave a comment, subscribe, and share with your friends.